Are FFPC drafters age discriminating against an impactful NFC running back? What NFC South receiver is being drafted high, but maybe not high enough? And which Bucks pass catcher is going to be the bust in Tampa this season? Plus, seven-time FFPC main event and Football Guys League champion Mark Davidson jumps on board to discuss Michael Pittman, Darren Waller, Cam Akers, and much more. We've got a great show for you. Dave Gerzak is here. I'm Eric Balkman. Stick around. Your high-stakes fantasy football hour starts Let's now. Broadcast live and heard around the world. You are now listening to the most entertaining hour of radio on the planet. It's the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com with your hosts, Eric Balkman and Dave Gerzak. The High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour is your home for football analysis from the best fantasy players in the world. And now, because no one else was available, here are Eric Balkman and Dave Gerzak. Hey, happy 4th of July to you, Rob. Greetings and salutations, all you balkaholics, anger, Zach, and addicts. Welcome to the latest episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com. I am, as always, your slightly above average host, Eric Balkman. My co-host is indeed the patron saint of fantasy football, the Dizzle, Dave Gerzak. Coming up on tonight's show, we're going to talk about what Cam Newton's impact is going to be on his new Patriots teammates, whether you should make room on your roster for Antonio Brown, and then Mark Davidson is going to join us to talk about how he's been treating Cortland Sutton, Ronald Jones, and more in his Football Guys draft. So far this summer, shout out to everyone in the chat room right now. You guys can post any questions you might have right in there. If you want to connect with us on Twitter at HSF at Bauer, at Eric Balkman at David Gerzak is where you can do that. Facebook.com slash HSF HSF at Bauer is where you can reach us. Uh, 347-426-3682. That's 347 Game Oba. If you want to uh, give us a call and uh, share your thoughts tonight on this, uh, really the middle part of uh, high stakes drafting season going on right now and of course you can email the show at the inbox high stakes fantasy football at gmail.com if you have any questions for us now is the time to send them we'll try to get to all the chat room questions tweets and emails in the fantasy feedback segment coming up uh, later on in the show shout out to uh, audio engineer and my best friend bryce as well as his buddy longtime listener donkey want to give donkey a shout out tonight and then of course uh, mutual friend and producer rob also working hard on this holiday weekend. Dave, good to have you back in the saddle after last week. Uh, you had a well-deserved week off. And uh, it's, it's interesting this weekend because um, I never know how drafts are going to go with the FFPC because I feel like, you know, everybody's doing holiday stuff and they want to shoot off fireworks and, and uh, drink adult beverages and, and just relax. But I feel like this is a big drafting weekend too. So if you want to hop in a football guys draft or, or a best ball, I feel like they do fill up pretty quick uh, on this. Historically, I feel like they filled up pretty quick on this weekend. I know Friday has been a big day for football guys today. I, I feel like it's going to be that way, not only um, tomorrow, but, but Sunday uh, as well. It, it always seems like they, they, they go good. Yeah. I mean, people are probably at home a lot more than usual because of the virus. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think people are going to be, you know, playing it close to home. It's not, you know, with the one-minute clock out, you can really carve out, you know, an hour and a half and knock out a draft very quickly. So it's pretty cool. That is what they've been, as, as a guy who's been facilitating a lot of them, I would say, you know, people always ask me in the past, well, Balky, how long are these football guys' drafts going? And I say, ah, you know, two, two hours, ten minutes, two and a half hours for the long, the long ones. But now it's like, like you said, Dave, it's like 90 minutes, uh, 100 minutes. That seems to be not, not short. That, that is average right now. Yeah, I mean, that's good. It's just it seems more fun. Like if you're a person who drafts a lot, you can draft one, let's say at one o'clock and you could do a six, you know, seven o'clock. Yeah. Else going on. So you can still have most of your day 
free not to be sitting on the board. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, we have a midnight draft that yours truly will be commissioning tonight. We'll try to fill that up. we got about uh, two hours or so before that one goes off. And then uh, we have drafts starting up right away at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. You can draft all day, uh, 4th of July weekend. And that's the thing. Too hot outside? Draft inside because it will be nice and cool and you can draft some hot teams there. Speaking of drafting hot teams, want to point out a couple of things about the FFPC. Not only are the live events that go at Planet Hollywood this September, but the main event early bird deadline ends on Monday at midnight Pacific. That's right, less than three days to go until you can uh, save on $100 off your first team. Remember, this is the best deal we're going to have all season on FFPC main event teams. Uh, you can save $400 off each additional team after that. And the main event is actually kicking off on Monday this year. That's right, main event slow draft. You and I forgot about that. Yeah, that's going on on Monday, both two-hour formats, two-hour timers, six-hour timers. That all happens uh, starting Monday. So we'll, uh, if you want to jump in on one of the first main events, get some early draft value, uh, You know, go ahead and do that because uh, they are going to go fast and furious shortly. The 2020 Football Guys Players Championship, of course, as we've been talking about, on this program, $500,000 grand prize, a $3.1 million prize pool. Uh, those drafts are popping off each and every day, several times a day. And if that's not your jam, hey, we get it. But remember, best ball slims, best ball standards. VPs, we should point out the Victory Point League. Uh, those are going off in the slow format. I think we have some live Victory Point Leagues that are filling up too, Dave. Uh, so check that out at myffpc.com. And don't forget, IC startups are still available. Were we supposed to do a shout-out to one of our uh, – the unofficial third – host of this program tonight, Dave? The third wheel. The third wheel, as it were. Yeah. Uh, hello, Farrell. Um, you know, feel free to play in Kentucky. We're going to be out there out when? The, yeah. Um, the, uh, two, two weeks before Labor Day, we will be out there for the main event in uh, just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, very excited about that. And um, that's right before the Labor Day draft is on. So if you want to get some, some drafts in, I know Farrell has, uh, they're taking a bit of a break from drafting right now, but you can sign up for, for you know, best balls and, and uh, they have the, the um, big payback plans going on out there too. This is probably literally the longest promotional. Let's, let's, sorry, sorry. All right. It's, it's getting a little. All right. KFSC.com. KFSC Thank you for listening, you Farrell. You include this stuff in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, whatever. MyFFPC.com. Check. Check both of them out. No particular yeah. order. Thanks to Football Guys, Roto World, and Rob for tonight's rundown. A.J. Brown, Dave, this according to Football Guys, recorded six catches of at least 50 yards last year. No other receiver in the NFL had more than four catches of at least 50 yards. And remember, A.J. Brown was a rookie last year. Now, I don't know how likely he is to sustain that level, but perhaps he gets even better in his second year. And he should be the guy in that offense. You know, he really leapfrogged Corey Davis last year, um, you know, who's sort of, and I think I've said on this program, I've given up the ghost on him. I'm done with him. He's a bust. I was wrong. I was wrong. Uh, No, he won't. He definitely won't. A.J. Brown is the wide receiver 16 at the 407 right now, Dave. Adam Thielen and Calvin Ridley going right in front of him. A pair of Rams wide receivers going right behind him in Cooper Cup and Robert Woods. This is not a high-volume passing offense in Tennessee, but it wasn't last year, and A.J. Brown was awesome during the home stretch last year. You buying that he can continue that, or is it going to be a letdown for anybody who drafts him in the mid-fourth? Uh, I think, you know, he has some upsides and downsides. The volume is really out of the concern. Uh, the fact that it is his second year, and he was really great his, his first year, it, it, you know, the arrow's pointing up for him. Right. Uh, there are some, other, some of the other players who can make compelling cases. I don't think you're I mean, it's really tough to kind of really totally go along with AJ Brown, in my opinion, if he stays healthy. I thought he'd be going higher, quite frankly. Um, I thought he'd I be more. He was at first because I think Meyer and all those guys are trying to push him up higher, and then he's finally, you know, kind of falling back a little bit. According to FantasyMojo.com, where it's where we get all our football guys FFPC data, check that out. Make sure if you are drafting in the FFPC, make sure you are subscribing to FantasyMojo.com. Darren Armani not only does a great job putting together the pros versus Joes every single year, but does a fantastic job putting together this ADP. Um, I'll get to A.J. Brown in a second. I, I know I brought this up with you personally, but I was commissioning a football guys draft on Sunday night, and the mascot at Tupacker had the first overall pick. Did not take McCaffrey, did not take Barkley. I should have realized what he was doing when he changed his team name to not fading Sanders prior to the draft. But he took Miles Sanders at the 101. I, I don't, I'm still speechless at that. I don't know why he would do it, but 
uh, certainly the non-sheeple rankings are dictating a Miles Sanders breakout this year. Yeah, those non-sheeple rankings had Tony Michelle ranked pretty high. <laughs> that was non-sheeple dynasty, though, wasn't it? Yeah, that's cool. I mean, they, by the way, I mean, I've had tons of boss, so I mean, I've got you Mario really crap. Right. It's actually pretty, pretty darn good at finding some of those jumps. Uh, yeah, and, and by the way, you can go those, back. Those first-round sleepers, those first-round yeah. jumps. Um, I, don't, I don't think I I could take Sanders over McCaffrey. It's interesting because I don't want to uh, – this is an A.J. Brown question. I don't want to dwell on Sanders too much. I'll just phrase it, uh, frame the question like this with Miles Sanders. You are still of the belief – I guess this is a yes or no question. You are still of the belief that Doug Peterson and that Eagles is still going to be more of a committee this year rather than letting Sanders take over as the full-time bell cow, given their history. I think one of the more recent shows, I kind of told you I was coming around on Sanders because okay. it just seems like he is – he is you know, he's a talented back, and it sounds like they're they're kind of thinking that he will get most of the carries. Boston Scott, I do like him though, actually, as a mid round mid round player. I do too. Yeah. And uh, you know, he, he's with the PPR value provides. I think he provides some standalone value there, so I, I like him. We're gonna go back to back. Would you rather's here first with Miles Sanders, Miles Sanders or Derrick Henry? In the round, obviously. Henry. I would too. Miles Sanders or Joe Mixon? Mixon. I would take Miles Sanders. Miles Sanders or Kenyon Drake? Sanders. I agree. And I think that, yeah. Well, kind of like the, I, I'm kind of following ADP. My answer is not on purpose. That's kind of how it's well, Mixon, actually, FFPC drafters are drafting Mixon after Sanders right now. Oh, really? I mean, it's, it's close, but they, they are going after. Okay, so then real quick with A.J. Brown. Now, the, all these guys I'm going to bring up are all going after A.J. Brown this year. A.J. Brown or Cooper Cup? Um, you know, that's really a tough one. Um, for what it's worth, I'm going to take Cup. Okay. Um. I'm going to take Brown. Cup kind of disappointed at certain points last year. I don't really, I can't explain it. So since I can't explain it, I'm going to take the ascending sophomore guy. I'll bring this up real quick because this is something I've researched and heard on a lot of podcasts. Cup actually, the last like third of the season, it was pretty bad for him. And sort of, we, we saw the rise of Higby when, when Everett got hurt. Yeah. And, and Coop, uh, Coop, Cup kind of disappeared yeah. towards the end of the season. I'm still buying over Brown. So what, what's the explanation? You didn't well, I think the, ex, the explanation is, is whatever reason, Goff had eyes, eyes for okay, Higby. That's fine. Okay, that's not an explanation to take Cup, actually. That's, all you just stated was what happened. Right. I'm, I'm just saying I like Cup personally this year. I'm talking about what happened last year. I still like Cup's but breath, Like, over the course of a season, I like Cup to outperform AJ. Okay, I mean, I guess my point would be that if you're, that, if you're taking Cup, I'd like there to be an argument as to kind of explain okay. what all right. happened okay. last year happened. Okay. Instead of just stating that it happened. Okay. That's what happened, all right? And, and why and is it going to be different this year? I think it's going to be different this year. Well, you, you, okay, understand this. We're talking about a small sample size at the end of last season. That was not the majority of the season last year. Majority of the season, Cup dominated. And I feel like that's what's going to happen, by and large, over the course of this next season, okay? All right. All right. I am not a believer in Higby. Uh, by the way, Darren Armani really frying uh, Tyler Higby on Twitter uh, this week. I don't know if you saw that. Talking uh, to, not on Twitter. Uh, that's true. Okay, well, he was saying, <laughs> well, I won't get into it. Uh, but it's very funny stuff. What did Higby ever do to him? Well, I, know, I don't know if somebody's talked back to Darren Armani on Twitter. I don't know about that, but it was very funny stuff. Okay. Um, A.J. Brown or Cooper Cup's real-life teammate, Robert Woods, who would you rather have this year? Uh, I, think I'll take, I think I'll still take Brown. I would, too, just because of the pure you know, upside of you know, trying to win $500,000. I think A.J. Brown's much more likely to do that uh, than Robert Woods. Right. Last one. A.J. Brown or D.K. Metcalf, Battle of the Initials? I'll take Brown. I would, too. I, you know, I, I don't mind Metcalf. I think he's an interesting, intriguing player uh, for this year. All right, moving on. Another intriguing player this year. Raheem Mostert has actually had contract extension uh, talks with San Francisco so far this offseason. We don't know how much progress they've made. Uh, this was a report from Matt Barrows on The Athletic who covers the 49ers. Now, Mostert obviously was the best guy in the backfield last year for San Francisco, but Tevin Coleman is still there. You have, obviously, Jarek McKinnon there this year. Um, th- there's a cavalcade of players in the San Francisco backfield that could make some noise. So, Dave, I'm just kind of curious. Mostert has some warts. Uh, there's other people in the backfield. He's an older guy. He's never really done it before last year. RB26 at the 506 in football guys drafts over the last four days. Is that a position you can get on board with Mostert, especially if you go maybe zero RB as your number one running back there? Sure, I can do that. Um, Devin Singletary is going right before him. Who do you like better, the the, uh, the Buffalo sophomore running back or the aged like a fine wine Raheem Mostert? I think I like Singletary more. I mean, because I, I, 
Zach Moss is the guy that you have to be concerned with with Singletary. They drafted him pretty early. But because they're going to have more of a virtual training camp or a training camp that's a little bit on the light side. And Singletary performed last year. Uh, Buffalo's an up-and-coming team. I think New England uh, is still going to be right. coming on. Yep. But Buffalo's tough, man. I think they're going to be playing with the lead a lot. Man. So that's a lot of rushing attempts and uh, you know, cap catches for Singletary. We have uh, Mark Davidson coming up here in just a couple of minutes. Before we get to him, I'm going to skip the Cam Newton question because we're going to ask uh, – uh, Mark, what he thinks about Cam Newton's effect is going to be on New England. I saw this story today from football guys, and I thought it was interesting, and I, I wanted to get your take on it, Dave. Um, John Brown, his production this year, apparently going to be helped and not hurt by the fact that Buffalo has added Stephon Diggs to their passing attack. This according to, you guessed it, their quarterback, Josh Allen. Quote, I think this is going to give him an opportunity to have more chances to catch the ball. Man-to-man, he's extremely tough to cover. Now, he's not going to get the number one corner on him anymore in 2020 because that guy should be on Stephon Diggs, which means John Brown will have the number two corner on him. He's super fast. He gets by defenders. And he was pretty good last year uh, in the first 11 weeks of the season, kind of tailed off after that. I'm curious. Uh, this isn't really a Stephon Diggs question, more of a John Brown question, Dave. We know how deep the wide receiver position is this year he is going at the 11 12 turn as wide receiver 52 you liking john brown there going right behind sterling shepherd justin jefferson right ahead of preston williams and curtis samuel or are you going to take somebody else there you know it's actually not a bad spot for him uh, but i because he did trade like that he really i think i'm taking somebody else for best ball leagues i understand the case for brown because to me he will go back to what he has been over the course of his career and that is a deep ball you know, Devery Henderson, you know, uh, f- five catches for 200 yards and two touchdowns, and then three catches for 15 yards the next week type. That's what I think John Brown's going to be. So I'd be much more likely to take him in basketball. As far as football guys drafts, I look at the guys going after him, rather have Preston Williams. I might rather have Curtis Samuel. I definitely would rather have Anthony Miller. And all of a sudden, Nikhil Harry and Maya, who are going behind John Brown, Interesting now after the Debo Samuel injury and the Cam Newton addition. Yeah, those guys like Nikhil Gary and Brandon, I get, get they have some up, they really have some true upside to them. Not that John Brown doesn't, but uh, I, I kind of get it. If you if you're trying to take a shot at players, I think those two players are guys that are good ones to take shots at. Right. Especially even if you want if you want zero RB and you're just taking like backup wide receivers, that's not that's not bad. Like in, in that case, I could see taking John Brown because he's more like a steady, semi-steady Eddie type. I guess I'm going to guarantee some production. But if you want to have you with running backs early on, and you're looking for someone a real breakout type guy, and you're trying to win the big money, those those are the types of players I would take over John Brown. I don't want to throw ADP at you at, right now, but of the three big pass catchers in Buffalo this year, Diggs, John Brown, Dawson Knox. Do you like Dawson Knox the best? Uh, on an ADP basis, but I mean, I do. I actually do like the I think. That, okay. I think he actually that players are drafting him too late. You know, anticipating you know Josh Allen sucks. This is that. Movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is a heck of a player. He's a really good football player. Wide receiver, twenty six at the six oh four. Uh, the last four days of the Football Guys Players Championship. That's he's, he's kind of moved up a little bit. A little bit, but not much. I mean, Keenan Allen, T. Y. Hilton going right ahead of him. Devontae Parker and Marquise Brown going right behind him. God, I'd rather have Diggs than Marquise Brown. No question. The fact that they're going that close. And by the way, I'd rather have Diggs over Parker as well. All right. Enough of our nonsense. Let's get into tonight's. VIP guest here on the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour. He is an avid longtime FFPC player, started back in 2014, two main event and five Football Guys Players Championship League titles, along with numerous second and third place showings in both competitions. His highest playoff finish uh, was when he finished 35th overall in the 2018 Football Guys Players Championship. Please welcome on to the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour, Mark Davidson. Mark, a happy early Independence Day to you. Thanks for doing the show this week, man. Same to you as well, and thank you very much. Excited to be here. Do you have big plans for this weekend, just hanging out with family, blowing up fireworks, and drinking a lot? What's what's the Mark Davidson uh, 4th of July plan? Everyone does what you do, Mark. Uh, probably fireworks and signing up for a couple of the uh, main event drafts and probably doing a couple uh, smaller drafts as well. That's cool, man. So uh, when, when, you talk, when you talk about signing up for the main events, are, are, are you, you're, do you like the, um, the slow draft format as opposed to the live? I mean, it, I, obviously there's a difference between the two, but you're liking the slow draft right now? 
I, I do. Um, you know, it, it gives me a little bit more time to go through things. Um, you know, sometimes life is kind of hectic. Uh, I got a house full of people and it's always something seeming to go on. So if I try to sit down for two hours, there seems to be a couple distractions that keep popping up. <laughs> um, the, the main event, I love the Vegas format. I love being out there. I love the, the whole situation. It just, it makes it feel special. So I, I just, I can't wait for those. <laughs> Yeah, you you and me Dave, both Dave, for sure. Well. Yeah, Dave as well. We're all we're all chomping at the bit to get out there. Before we get into the fan- yeah, exactly. Uh, before we get into the fantasy football uh, part of the interview tonight, Mark, can you tell the listeners what you're doing for a living? Right now, I am currently semi-retired. Had a a very long and successful 25 years uh, as a sales manager for a financial institution, and had an opportunity to kind of step away, step away from all the stress and uh, kind of relocate and just wanted to kind of work on getting myself kind of healthy and taking a, a relaxing view of my life, help get my kids through high school, and uh, spend a lot more time at my, my big hobby, which was fantasy football, and I've been able to do that for the last few years and thankfully haven't, uh, haven't needed to jump back into the workforce and really happy and content with the way things are right now. Good for I, you, I man. Love that. Yeah, that's a good answer. It's a very peaceful, serene, well, I right. love the answer. It's a very zen answer, quite yeah, frankly. Exactly. Just you're you're at one with yourself. <laughs> you know you know you know what you need to do. I like it quite a bit. Um, okay, now the meat and potatoes part. We're gonna get into strategy yep. here, Dave. Yep. Speaking of Dave, we're talking to Dave Montgomery. You got hyped up quite a bit last year at running back, and then uh, this wasn't all that great. Fizzled out. Fizzled out. Yes, that's technically would be the the way that one could describe it. Um, but are you drafting? It seems like you're drafting in multiple spots in the football guys started championship uh, this year. Do you think uh, you're going to have a, a sophomore, I guess, non-slump? He's really going to come on this year. I do. Um, you know, what, I, what I've been finding is that I, I kind of have a, a, a unique strategy how I kind of go about things. And if I get uh, 10, 11, 12 draft spots, what I've been tending to do is, is lean heavy towards receiver with the first two, maybe three picks, and try to backfill. Because what I've been seeing in the drafts I've been doing is a guy like Montgomery, you know, he'll fall into like the fourth, fifth round, and I can get him in either the RB1 or an RB2. But a couple instances of my teams, I've got Julio Hopkins and Schuster is my first three players. So having a guy like David Montgomery – I think he's going to have a good year. I think he's going to outproduce what he did last year. And I think uh, having a, a top three before him on my team with him is going to make it even even more solid. And another team I have, I have Julio, uh, Tyreek Hill, Ertz, and Fournette, and I got him as an RB too. So in those situations, I feel really comfortable with the kind of production. Plus, having Foles there, um, if he doesn't win that job, Trubisky is going to have to outperform him. And I think Chicago, they're going to elevate their quarterback play. And I think overall, they'll be a much better, more competitive team this year. You know, this kind of – go ahead, Dave. I was going to say, actually, you know, some of those teams you listed, those are some really nice starts. I mean, really – Right. Nice oh, absolutely. And you're, yeah. you're getting – you're getting like a three down back in a, in a pretty good offense. You know, you know, granted, it's not an elite offense. With Montgomery and Fournette, by the way. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So and it, it's not, it wasn't an elite offense. So with Foles, you don't know what's going to happen. No, I mean, yeah. and there is some upside, definitely. Um, this reminds me, too, I should I tell everybody, rotoviz.com slash podcast, we had a new high-stakes lowdown that just got posted today with, oh, right. with Rob Abbott. But I want to bring this up because this is what Mark just reminded me of because Rob actually had an interesting take about the third and fourth round running backs that are going off in football guys drafts this year. You can check that out. And and, and uh, I do want to ask Mark this, too. Mark, when you, you, know, you talk about Fournette, you talk about Montgomery, when you're picking at the back end, of football guys drafts this year, and you're looking at those wide receivers in the first couple of rounds, besides Montgomery and Fournette, are there any other third and fourth run, uh, fourth round running backs that you've been targeting that you've been looking at that you really like this season? <laughs> yeah, um, Ronald Jones. You know, a, a lot of my friends, when I read my teams off to them, they kind of laugh at that pick, but, you know, <laughs> I <laughs> – and maybe there's a lot of people on this call that are laughing too, but in my opinion, no, 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 come on. I'm laughing because it's funny. I totally understand why. I understand why they're laughing. Right, exactly. I, I, yeah. I think it's great. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you look at the setup there. I mean, the offense is going to be dynamic. It's going to be a high volume. Uh, they're they're going to be a, a championship contender type of team. 
And basically, he has no competition. I mean, you're bringing in a rookie, uh, and I understand the hype around Vaughn, but Jones proved himself towards the end of last year, and he put up some pretty decent numbers. So he's the veteran. He knows the offense. You know, uh, is it Agunabali? Uh, you know, he's going to get some third down, some third down play. But if Jones can keep his nose on straight, I think he's going to he's going to significantly outperform the projections. And having him as an RB two or an RB three for bye weeks, I think uh, I think there's a lot of upside there. So let's talk about Ronald Jones here real quick. And, and by the way, too, I, I, uh, you don't have to, if you are drafting in the Football Guys Players Championship, you don't have to necessarily sink a quote-unquote early round pick into Ronald Jones because over the last four days, he's going as running back 33 at the 704. Remember, he finished at running back 25 in FFPC scoring last year, too. So he is being drafted lower uh, than where he finished last season. And I got to ask you this, Mark, as long as we're on the, uh, on the topic of, of Ronald Jones, I would imagine that if you're buying into him, Keyshawn Vaughn is going to find himself nowhere near your rosters this year, right? Uh, he, he'll find if he – well, no, he won't because where I would take him, he's already gone. A lot of times he's, he's going, a, in my opinion, a lot higher – Everybody's buying in that he's going to be the guy, and they're, they're um, kind of downplaying Ronald Jones. I wouldn't mind having him in case something happened to Ronald Jones, and I have that late-round handcuff, but with the pick I would have to expend to do that, it's not worth it for me. You think about it, too. Ronald Jones was a, a pedigree guy that, that, that Tampa invested a premium pick into, too. So, and, and the fact that, you know, I think, and, and myself included, I'm kind of guilty in this, um, Lou Tranquilli, I know I brought this up on, on the show many, many times, uh, many a time over, and that's um, the, the fact that Lou Tranquilli, a, a, a noted long, long time, very successful high stakes player, gives running backs basically like six games, seven games to prove themselves uh, on the NFL field. And if they can't, you know, turn it on with them uh, by then, he is, you know, trading them off in dynasties, getting rid of them, not targeting them in future years in, in drafts, too. And I think the thing that's important to remember is that while Jones started off slow, he's a super young guy. I mean, very young coming yep. into the draft, a guy that, that really came on at the end of last season. Can he turn it on again? I hope so. I already have some shares of him for sure. Um, but a, a young guy that's trying to make his way in the world uh, in the NFL that I think can help <laughs> FFPC owners uh, for sure. Make his way in the world. Make his way in the world, Dave. He's a young, young stallion. He's not established. He's he is, just trying to make his way. You know, and we go from young stallions to old horses, and that is Julio Jones here, a uh, guy that has been um, helping fantasy owners over and over and over and over again. Uh, he's on the wrong side of 30, Mark. He continues to be a top five option at wide receiver in the Football Guys Players Championship, according to the uh, drafters there. Why do you think fantasy owners should not be concerned about his age, not be concerned about Calvin Ridley taking a big step forward, and still grab Julio Jones in the mid-second, like I know you have uh, done already several times this season? Yep, because he's on the right side of 32. He's, he's still – I think he'll still be 30 throughout this whole season – you know, he has that rapport with Matt Ryan. That's a high-volume offense, a passing offense. He consistently is getting in the mid to high 170s or 150s, 160s, 170s a target. He's just a, he's a known quantity that isn't going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Um, he, he's very safe. Uh, he's got what I consider, you know, a very high floor and, you know, a, a pretty high ceiling still too. I mean, he can put up some big numbers. Ridley, uh, you know, he, he actually it looked like regressed a little bit last year because he had that spectacular rookie season with all the touchdowns. Um, losing Hooper and, and filling in Hayden Hurst, you know, I don't think Hoop, I don't think Hurst, he's going to be good. I don't think he's going to be Hooper-esque. And uh, Julio is always going to be that go-to guy. So I, I just, I think he's safe. I, I, don't, I think you don't have to worry about taking him and all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's going to lose – you know, two tenths of a second off of his uh, forty time, he's gonna start dropping balls and fall into you know an, a, a wide receiver fifteen type category. I think he's gonna he's got a couple more really good years left in him before he starts to age. Hanging out at the FFPC main event as I have the last few years, Dave. This is not true of any one particular high stakes player. This is true of several high stakes players. You know, you walk through the ballroom, you you eavesdrop on conversations that players are having with other players. I would say at least three times within the last six or seven years, I have heard somebody say the words, everybody always forgets about Julio. 
And and it seems like it happens all the time. You know, like because he's not he's super excited. He's a super talented player. He plays in an elite offense. And sometimes I think we get enraptured in, in the next new thing, the Amari Coopers of the world, the Odell Beckhams of the world. And yet Julio Jones still seems to produce. And in the mid second round, I know I'm on board with that. Are you on board with that as a top five option for, for wide receiver in, in FPC? Yeah, if I'm going wide receiver, I would be sure. Okay, there you go. What about tight end? Let's talk about that. All right. You mentioned actually Austin Hooper just in the prior question. He's coming off a big year in Atlanta, now moved on to Cleveland. Uh, there's so many guys, there's so many targets, there's so many hyped up players. We have Odell Beckham, Landry, and Joku, also playing tight end, Nick Chubb, and Kareem Hunt, who actually equaled Chubb last year when he was there. Um, do you think Austin Hooper is still a player drafters should target? And actually, I'm curious, out of all those other players, I'm feeling, are there some pass catchers you're interested in other than Hooper? So, that, that's a great question, because the way I look at Hooper, you know, it, it all depends on how I've set my team up and where I can get them. You know, as you mentioned, I started in 2014, um, and, and I'll, be, I'll be the first to admit, my first season, I think I finished 1-12. Uh, and 12. I was horrible. I made uh, every mistake you could make, but, you know, I learned from those mistakes. And one of those was downplaying tight end and waiting until, you know, loading up my roster and then waiting until late and grabbing a, uh, a Jay Sternberger or a Kyle Rudolph, uh, a Will Disley, somebody like that. Cooper is the kind of guy, if you have, in my opinion, if you have a good roster set after seven or eight picks and you haven't grabbed the tight end, he is going to be a he, he's going to be a producing good uh, t- tight end one for you on your team. If you're in a situation where you've already drafted a tight end, I wouldn't grab him where he's currently be gra- where he is currently being picked. I think he's going to have a regression of numbers, but I still think he's going to be a productive fantasy tight end. There's just too many awesome. too many mouths to feed that offense. Yeah, and, and actually, and I would say this too. go ahead. Mark. I was going to say. Too many big mouths to feed in that offense. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually great. And not not only Beckham, <laughs> but uh, but also David and Joku. We found out just a few hours ago has asked Cleveland for a trade. They want to hang on to him. I don't know if they're going to be moving him at all, but certainly if they do, good news for Austin Hooper, who's currently being drafted as the tight end 15 at the 904 in football guys draft. So over the last four days, it's interesting because there's a little bit of a run there with Gronk. Uh, Jared Cook, T.J. Hawkinson, Noah Fant, and then Hooper. Hooper sort of at the back end of that. Uh, nice consolation prize if you are targeting a a uh, you know late uh, back end tight end one early uh, early tight end two there, Dave. It's kind of it's interesting to me that um, that Hooper is kind of would be behind Hawkinson. You know, just as a comparison. I would rather Hooper. Yeah, I mean he's a proven player who's I mean, not who's not hurt uh, consistently. Not, yeah, I mean and Hawkinson had like one good week last year, and otherwise was. Scott was week one. Yeah. That was it. He was hot garbage all year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're pretty much just drafting him based on you know, the sophomore was drafted drafted early and based on potential purely. At least Fran had a few good weeks. Right. And and, and I misspoke too. That's they, a Hawkinson rant for us. Hawkinson is is still kind of hurt right now. Like we don't. We, really? Yeah, we don't know his his full health, uh, and and we probably won't know for a while. And I think that's an awfully big leap to make when you have a guy yep. like. Fans, when you have a guy like Cooper right behind him. One other point about Hawkinson that sucks for is he's really good at blocking. You don't want a guy who's really all that no. good at blocking. Yeah. He's good at receiving. You're not getting any points for any blocks all the Right. Oh, you yeah. know, the FFPC has always been a friend to tight end scoring, Dave. Maybe we need to look at that in future <laughs> years. Pancake blocks, <laughs> half point, something like that. Half point uh, PCB, uh, as it were. Only the Scott Crystal would do that. We're talking, hey, those drafts kick off on Monday, by the way. Um, we're talking with Mark Davidson here, a seven-time champion in the FFPC main event and Football Guys Players Championship. Just talking about tight ends here. Let's shift back to wide receivers, rookie wide receivers, that is. Michael Pittman's getting some hype right now. Why do you think uh, T.Y. Hilton, uh, Mark, is still the better option, despite you having to take him eight rounds earlier than where Pittman is going in drafts? So I'm a big proponent of receivers, of rookie wide receivers. It usually takes the – now – the last couple of years, we're starting to see a little trend. Receivers are developing a little quicker. But go back and look. I think it was 2017. You had three receivers in the first ten picks of the draft. It was Corey Davis, Mike Williams, and John Ross. How did they turn out? You know, awesome. a lot of these receivers, if you look at them, uh, the top two or three rounds, their numbers are actually mediocre. 
you know, they'll have a couple good games here and there. T.Y. Hilton is just flat out consistent. You know, he, he's a proven professional. He's, you know, he, he's 30, 31 this year, you know, and you, you, he's kind of got a turd of a quarterback coming to him, you know, Phil Rivers and that little <laughs> sidearm sling he has. But, you know, Rivers is, Rivers is a professional, and he understands how to get the ball, and he knew how to get the ball to Keenan Allen. And I think, uh, you know, Hilton, is a, he's a special receiver, and he's proven. I, last year was his worst year, and I kind of looked at his numbers. That being his worst year, he still performed right around some of the, uh, I think it was A.J. Brown, Metcalf, and McLaurin type of numbers, and then all the other guys, he blew them out of the water. And that was his worst season in the last seven. I just think he's healthy. Um, the offensive line's pretty solid. They're going to have a really good running game. Uh, you know, Pittman will be nice, but he's a rookie, and there's no guarantees he's going to turn out to be like a, a, a Debo Samuel or an A.J. Brown. He may end up turning out to be like a, a Zay Jones or a Curtis Samuel. So until he proves himself, I'd rather go with the known, the known quantity. That's my opinion. Yeah, and I think you're – yeah, I, I think you're right with Pittman. I mean, we don't know what he's going to turn out to be. I think that, that Indianapolis, for whatever it's worth, I, I think they view him as their number one receiver of the future, um, but not currently. And I can't help but think, you know, that offensive line, not that you undersold it, but I think that is one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. I think the rushing attack that they have now with Taylor and Mack and Hines, that is going to be such a weapon for them. And, and it's just going to yep. open things up. I, I think that T.Y. Hilton's the perfect receiver to be benefiting from something like that. So I think Hilton could be in for a career year, despite having to catch passes from a quarterback he's never caught passes from before with, with the lack yeah. of the offseason. And remember, too, it's not like – you remember when they, they, we call him turn yes Hilton because he'd always go at that 2-3 turn. He went at the 1-2 turn a couple of years ago. Dude is going at the 6-0-2 right now as wide receiver 25 in the Football Guys Players Championship. He's never been cheaper. I feel like the used car salesman for the Indianapolis Colts mm-hmm. right now. Go out and get that Dodge Colt, the T.Y. Hilton edition, yes. because he is going to pay dividends at the 6 miles aren't too high. No, they're not. They are definitely not too high. Not that like they are on Miles Sanders. Uh, going in the first round, but I'm saying. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's talk about tight ends here, Mark. Uh, now, we have uh, on this program over the last month or so, we've compared Zach Ertz and Mark Andrews as far as what high-stakes players like better between those two guys. I want to shift the focus a little bit here and ask you who the better value is right now uh, between Zach Ertz going at the end of the third or Darren Waller going essentially almost a full round later at the end of the fourth. Who do you think is the better value right now for Football Guys Players Championship draft? Boy, that that is a tough question. Um, I, I've gone back and forth on it because I can make a case both ways. But if I if you held a gun to my head, I would have to go with Ertz, just based on the fact that he, he's got all the weapons. Wentz has all of his weapons back this year, um, and, and even though you still have Dallas Goddard there, and he started to eat into some of the some of the uh, targets last year, you know Ertz is still relatively young enough. I think he's got one or two more good seasons in him. Um, Waller, yes, you're getting him around later. Uh, He actually had better numbers than Ertz did last year, but I think Ertz suffered a little bit because of the lack of weapons, and they started clamping down on him a lot. And uh, I I I would – I I just – I'm a big Zach Ertz fan. And I I think uh, when Waller has one year, albeit a fantastic year of production, but I just – with those Raiders – I'm a I'm a lifelong Bronco fan, and there's I just I absolutely can't stand the Raiders. Anything about them and <laughs> fantasy football. <laughs> there's they, a real answer, folks. <laughs> they crushed really my soul more times. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> Earth is Earth is a proven commodity. Um, I think with all the weapons being back this year, uh, I think Philly. I think he's going to see a little bit of a resurgence, and I think you know he'll he'll continue to be the Zach Ertz for one more year. Um, while I don't think there's going to be a big disparity, but hold a gun to my head, I'd go with Ertz. You know, the thing is with Ertz here, and, and I feel like um, in, in drafting fantasy leagues, regardless of tight end premium or not, for the last, and, and I don't think I'm exaggerating here, three years plus, I have gotten Zach Ertz more than any other tight end, and it's not close. And I feel like part of the reason, or at least a big reason why, is the Dallas Goddard thing is baked in to him falling. And every single year, yep. um, I, I always hear it from the Zach Ertz haters, well, this is Goddard's year, this is Goddard's year. 
And Goddard, it's not like he's been bad. He's been all right. But Ertz is still getting a ton of targets. He's getting a ton of catches. He's still churning out a ton of fantasy points. Um, so I feel like Ertz, at the end of the third, you're already getting a value on him because there's a lot of people that won't take him that early because of the Goddard effect. And, and when you compare him to Waller, give me the safety of Ertz, knowing that I have that elite guy right away at the end of the third, and then I can play the board, get a running back, get a receiver there. I don't feel compelled to have to grab Darren Waller uh, at the end of the fourth round if I play it that way. Dave, I don't know if you have a thought on Ertz versus Waller when you're talking about a round apart. You know, honestly, I would make pretty much all the same points you guys both made. I do okay. I prefer Ertz also. Uh, I, I, just, I think you can sleep better at night if you have a main event team with Ertz on it. You just be like, oh, yeah, Ertz versus Waller. It's like, oh, yeah, he had a good year. He had a good year. And you think about all those pass catchers the Raiders invested in this past offseason. You yeah. know, it's just, I don't know. I, I think there's there could be a shift. Not to, you know, to say Philly didn't. I mean, they take they took Jalen Rager in the first round of the draft. But Raiders got, I mean, three of their first four picks were wide receivers, for God's sake. You know, you know where they're yep. trending. And getting, getting DJ back, actually, for the Eagles, might, I really do think that actually could help Ertz by stretching the field a little bit, and Ertz will open it up. You know, he might open up the middle of the field a little bit. Yeah, uh, have a DJ that's a good point. All right, moving on. Let's talk Cam Newton. He's going to be the starter for the Patriots, unless, you know, something happens. Good gracious. Um, <laughs> how does this affect your evaluation of Patriots skill players like Julie Edelman, who is going insanely late? Who, where was his ADP, like ninth round? At least? Edelman? Uh, yeah, it, yeah, he he has he has moved up, but not that much. He's yeah. like at like late eighth yeah. right now. Former third. Oh no no, excuse round. me, late seventh, late seventh now. Used to be a third and fourth round pick. Now late seventh. He was a ninth rounder for a while. Nikhil Harry is going the sixteenth, seventeenth range. I have no idea where he's going now, but anyway, what do you think about those two fellows? And also, uh, Muhammad Sanu, the second rounder, they traded a second round pick for him. What do you think of him actually? Because he's on, he's gonna be out there. He's gonna be one of the edge receivers. So, you know, I I will tell you. I'm, I'm thankful because I do have some exposure to Sanu and uh, Edelman. And I was hoping and praying that, I mean, Cam Newton just seemed like, especially with Belichick, I just can't see Belichick going into the season with Jared Stidham as his quarterback. You know, he's, he's got such a long history. He, he just, he's very competitive. He, he's not going to want to see Tom Brady out there being successful and him riding on Stidham. That's just my opinion. Bringing in Newton seemed like it, it just seemed like it was going to be a no brainer. I do think it elevates the skill players, but the thing that concerns me a little bit is that there was a really unique and weird chemistry between the New England, especially Edelman and Brady. There was, there was almost like a uh, – they were like psychic. The way they ran their route tree, it was – you know, there was a pattern, but you didn't know Edelman, based on what he read, would run one pattern and, and Brady would have to read the same thing, and they were so in sync. Well, when you bring in Cam Newton, you're not going to have that. Um, but Edelman, is, he is truly one of those professionals that he'll find a way to get open, and Newton is such a talented QB, he'll find a way to get him the ball. Him and Sanu, I think, are both going to have big, big years. I'm not big on Nikhil Harry yet. He needs to prove himself to me. Nikhil Harry in uh, Football Guys drafts has uh, lurched quite a bit forward. He is going at the 12-11. And, Mark, I, I, I think I'm taking the words out of your mouth here. When you compare Nikhil Harry in the 12th round versus Muhammad Sanu in the 18th, you're going Sanu every day of the week and twice on Sunday when yep. that's the comparison between him and Harry, right? Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting Sanu. I've got him on a few teams in the same thing, 17th, 18th round. Having a guy like that on your team, uh, you know, especially when you come to bye weeks. I mean, it's, you just you never know. It, it, just, it seems like too much of, a, of an upside of what that guy can give you. He is, a, he is a really talented receiver that a lot of people sleep on because he's been living in Julio Jones' shadow. Well, he came over to the team midseason. But, you know, he just, it's still tough to adjust and really make it. And he got hurt too, right? Well, well, yeah, and he was a pedigreed yep. guy. And, I mean, not that I want to talk about where he got picked in the NFL draft, but I feel like he was a pretty pedigreed guy there. I mean, there, there's a lot of talent there. He's an SEC player. Uh, there's, some, there, there's something there. And when you talk yep. about 18th round receivers, I, I mean, in, in comparison to, you know, who else is going around Sanu, you're going to take Muhammad Sanu or Trent Taylor or Devin Funchess or John Ross, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, to, to me, it's so obvious that Sanu is the pick right there. Uh, it makes perfect sense. All right, uh, Mark, let's get into a, a couple of emails that we got in from, uh, from some listeners this week for you. Um, the first one is from Ray in Lexington. He wants to know, have you been taking any chances on Cam Akers 
in the fifth round this year on account of his upside. Thanks, Mark. That is Ray in Lexington, uh, Kentucky. Thank you so much for the email, Ray. What about Cam Akers? Has he found his way on any of your rosters so far this year, Mark? Not yet, but the, the main reason is that because of the position, for whatever reason, you guys seem to hate me, and you keep giving me the 11th and 12th picks. So I end up going receiver. <laughs> receiver. <laughs> I go receiver heavy, and when I'm at that fifth round pick, I'm looking at Cam Akers or Ronald Jones, and it goes back to that. You know, you still have Henderson there. You still have Malcolm Brown. Um, you know, Henderson they drafted early last year. Akers has a ton of potential, but Ronald Jones, he, he's proved himself a little bit. So I'd rather go with that. I'd rather go with a, a Devin Singletary. Um, that's kind of the, been the way I've been leaning. But I'll tell you, if he would slip a little bit farther back, I would definitely consider him in like the sixth or seventh, but he's just he's not there at that point. But I'd rather go with a little bit more of a proven player. Hey, Mark, I'm going to talk to our tech guys, and we're going to, we'll have them adjust the randomizer if you came on the show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mark, speaking of uh, Rams running backs, um, if Akers hasn't made his way on any of your rosters yet so far, have you been taking, given that they're much cheaper than Akers, have you been taking any shots on, on uh, Malcolm Brown or, or Daryl Henderson at all? No, I haven't, not yet. Because um, that whole situation, it just, it, it's really throwing the dice. And uh, there's just one of the guys that I've, I've been grabbing, um, I've been grabbing Hines. Uh, I just, I, I keep seeing, you know, he, he seems to be a third down, even though they've got Mac, even though they've got Taylor, you know, he's, he seems to be that could potentially be that next PPR third down back Danny Whitehead type of guy. Um, so I, I've been taking a, a chance on a guy like that, that I think is a little bit more of a, of a proven commodity. Um, I just, those other two guys, it, it's still too early to really figure out what they're going to do there. And you know Akers is going to get a lot of exposure, and I just I don't want to waste the uh, the draft pick I would need to waste. I just there's too many other players in there that have a little bit more value to me. I mean, Akers goes around the same spot as like David Montgomery. Uh, I can tell you right now, as as and far as yeah, yeah, I mean, as far as the last four days of football guys goes, Akers goes right ahead of essentially uh, Devin Singletary right now. Five oh five for Akers, five oh six for Singletary. Um, Akers is actually going behind. Mm-hmm. Where's Montgomery? Oh, David Montgomery is yeah, going to after Singletary, 507. Yeah, so I think that's a little bit they're crazy all bunched up. You know, Singletary and, and Montgomery are actual football players in play. <laughs> and Akers is not. Um, you know who else is sandwiched right between Singletary and Montgomery, Dave? Uh, a guy we talked about earlier in the program, a little, little bit older, but crushed it at the end of last season, helped people win a lot of fantasy titles, and that's Raheem Mostert. So you have Akers going, and then Singletary, Mostert, Montgomery right after that. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, we're talking with Mark Davidson, a seven-time league champ in the FFPC Main Event Football Guys Players Championship, finished 35th overall in the FPC in 2018. One final email from a listener I want to get to tonight uh, for you, Mark. Uh, this is from Pete in Wichita. He writes, uh, with all the rookie weapons that the Broncos added for Drew Locke, is the grizzled veteran of the group, Cortland Sutton, the play there after a truncated offseason? Pete, we appreciate the email. Do you like Cortland Portland Sutton is the Broncos' uh, pass catcher to own there uh, so far, Mark. This this is a tough one because I am I'm a diehard Bronco fan. Um, he is he is one of the players I am not drafting. Um, the reason is where he's going. He, what, you know the drafts that I've done so far, he's going around the fifth round. I am I, I'm very close to the Broncos, the insider information, all that kind of stuff that, you know, you, you get from some of the local the local stuff. You know, Drew Locke last year, pretty much through training camp and even into the season, he was he was a significant disappointment. Um, I think it was more of a situation that, you know, uh, Flacco got hurt, then they went to, uh, I think it was Brandon Allen came in as a quarterback and, they realized, you know what, the, the wheels are off the wagon. Let's just throw a lock in there and get him some game experience. His season last year reminded me a lot of that miracle season of Tim Tebow's where it was some of the worst quarterbacking, but somehow they managed to be there at the end of the game and pull stuff off. He still, to me, is a rookie quarterback who hasn't proven himself. They've got all these weapons, but now Cortland Sutton is the, the wide receiver number one. And I actually went and looked. If you looked at his, his last um, eight games last year, his numbers 
were pretty pedestrian. I think he was on track for he would have averaged 60 receptions for about 900 yards and five touchdowns. So for, you know, being the uh, fifth round pick, I think there's a lot of other guys out there that have much higher upside. Not to say that in a year or two, Sutton isn't going to be a stud, but you're bringing in KJ Hamler. You're bringing in Jerry Judy. Like I said earlier, they're rookies. You don't know what you're going to get. Um, And then you bring in Melvin Gordon, who's going to want to touch the ball a lot. You still have a good young tight end in Noah Font. You still have Phil Lindsay. And you've got uh, just a woeful offensive line. And no matter what they try to tell you about all the tricks they're doing to it, I, I just, I'm not a big believer in it. So I think there's going to be some issues. Sutton's going to be the guy that gets double teamed while everybody else tries to figure it out. And uh, for, a, for the fifth round pick, I don't think you're getting the value that you're going to want out of that. Yeah, and, and Mark points this out too. Sutton is going smack dab in the middle of the fifth round with a glut of five, or excuse me, four other receivers there. He goes right behind DK Metcalf, and I like Metcalf better than Sutton. And then right after him, you have DJ Chark, you have Tyler Lockett, and Terry McLaurin. So those guys are all going right in that mid fifth, and I think you can make a case for several of those other guys over Sutton based on what you just said too, Mark. So, so good points, by the way. From a Broncos fan, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting it right from the horse's mouth, literally, and that is a horse joke. All right, Dave, go on with our last with our last question for Mark. You know, Mark Mark's done such a nice job. He should really be. He should come in as a guest. Oh, I'm, I'm down for that. Show. I am down for that. Yes. You know, I don't know if you ever listen to our show, Mark, but I, I take a few weeks off once in a while. You know, I'm, I'm a little lazy. Occasionally. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so anyway, Mark, who's a player you've been targeting, uh, actually avoiding your draft this year, and a player you've been targeting in the mid to later rounds? We are talking redraft, not dynasty. So one of the other players that I'm I'm avoiding like the plague is uh, Mark Ingram. Um, he's going around the sixth round. There's a, a lot of running backs in that position. I just with that with that offense, I know it's a run offense, but you look at the the running back core they have there. And you look at Ingram's totals last year, you know, he's getting – it started to dwindle towards the end of the year. He was getting 16, 15, 16 carries a game, started to dwindle towards the end of the year. They draft Dobbins pretty high. They're still pretty high on uh, Edwards, and they still have Justice Hill working around in the background. They're a team that's probably going to have a lot of blowouts, and I think they're going to be resting some people, and I just – I don't see Ingram as that guy in the third and fourth quarters getting carried, so – you know, for a guy going in the sixth round, I, I don't want that guy to be getting, you know, 12 or 13 carries for 50 yards and maybe a touchdown, no reception. So I'm kind of steering clear of him. In uh, in terms of guys that I really like, um, there's two of them. It's uh, is a late receiver, uh, Jamison Crowder. A lot of people kind of laugh at me when I, when I say that, but, you know, he has a, a chemistry with Sam Darnold. And you look at the total targets, I mean, there was, there was multiple games he got double-digit targets thrown at him. And granted, they're five-yard passes, but, you know, he's, he's still putting up eight for 80. He's still putting up some decent numbers, and, you know, I was catching him around the 10th or 11th or 12th round. That's not a bad guy to have sitting on your bench when you have bye weeks or injury issues, somebody that you know you can throw in there. Uh, the other guy that I have that I think he's starting to show up on drafts now, but he wasn't earlier – was uh, Steven Sims out of Washington. You know, he had a, uh, just an unbelievable last four, four weeks last year. He was averaging nine targets a game, almost 17 fantasy points. Um, I was surprised how many drafts uh, that, you know, you're talking 15, 16, 17th round, nobody touched him. He's starting to go a little bit sooner now, but he's just somebody that, again, if you're sitting there on the back of your bench and you get a couple injuries or something, you know, you don't have to surf through the waiver wire. He might be a guy that could give you some pretty stellar production. Yeah, I know that Washington drafted Antonio Gandy-Golden. Uh, obviously, they're going to use their running back Antonio Gibson as well uh, in the passing game. But there is something to be Kelvin, Kelvin Harmon. Uh, Kelvin Harmon is going to be back this year with, with a vengeance, uh, Dave. Um, <laughs> and uh, But there is something to be said for Sims and, and the connection that he exhibited with Dwayne Haskins at the end of last season, and the fact that you can get him in the 17th round of Football Guys Players Championship drafts certainly makes him a very attractive buy. A guy who is always an attractive buy as far as listening to this show is indeed Mark Davidson, the seven-time winner of FFPC Main Event and Football Guys Players Championship drafts. Mark, thanks so much. Uh, It's a holiday weekend. We can't thank you enough for hopping aboard. Hopefully we can have you on again soon. I wish you nothing but the best in all of your drafts. 
uh, going forward, especially those main events that are starting next week. And, uh, and best of luck to you. Have a safe and, and happy 4th of July, man. Well, same to you. I, again, I really appreciate this opportunity, and any time I would love to do this. This was a blast. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark Thanks, Davidson, Mark. ladies and gentlemen, uh, popping aboard on the HSFF Hour tonight. Uh, what a pleasure. Very well-spoken, very intelligent it's guy. Really, and really, by the way, he wins. It sucks when I'm like the third best. God, <laughs> oh, come yeah, on. I beat him on third. That's not true at all. Uh, maybe this tonight. So, so, when, I'm, I showed. Like, when, I, like, I yeah, showed you showed. Yeah, yeah, so place, Mark uh, is the win, I'm the place, and yeah. then you're the show. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah. The, sucks. Yeah. All so, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make up for it the next number of minutes. Is the Kentucky Derby, is that coming up in August? Speaking yeah, it's, of it's, around, it's around Labor Day weekend or something. Are we going to be in, in actually Kentucky for the Kentucky Derby? No, I'll be running a draft a time. We'll oh, it's the draft a time weekend. I think okay. it is draft time All right, all right. Uh, Which I'll, means I'll speak about, you know, eh, 12 hours over the whole weekend. Yeah, no, but I mean. Pretty, I mean, that is such a, okay. I, mean, I swear, I just hope that all the COVID crap kind of has calmed down and people aren't too worried and that the draft a time goes really well. It's great. We're raising, raising money, by the way, for the Harbor House. A domestic abuse shelter here in Appleton, Wisconsin. I saw that. I, I, I was surprised. I actually, My daughter Ella is kind of, she's, you know, she's raising, helping, helping us with that a little bit. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. She, she's volunteered there for a number of years. Really? Okay. Yeah, Monday night, she, she works with children's group therapy. The, the, the person they just hired to take it over, actually, I went to high school with. Oh, really? She just got hired. She was working in Madison for, for many years, and now she's uh, the head of Harbor House. Which yeah, it's is, a great place. Yeah. Fantastic. Props to Fox Valley Lutheran. Well, all oh, yeah, all we do is turn out greatness. Yeah, that's fine. And greatness and me. Yeah. All right, so speaking of uh, greatness, let's get to some fantasy feedback here tonight uh, with some emails that came in from uh, listeners. Kick it off with Henry in Philadelphia. He writes... Mudo? Uh, is, Henry Mudo, Mudo doesn't live in Philly, does he? Uh-huh. I don't think he does. Uh, Dear Tyreek and Sammy, <clears throat> seems like some football guys drafters are getting a little carried away with McCole Hardman. What am I missing here? Hopefully you'll read this on air as I plan on relaxing in my hammock, listening to the podcast on the afternoon of the 4th. That is Henry in Philadelphia listening to this right now in his hammock tomorrow, essentially. All right. Great question, actually. So, okay, so McCall Hardman, Dave, uh, as far as football guys, drafters are selecting him. He is wide receiver 44. He is going in the mid-10th behind Darius Slayton and Jerry Judy ahead of Manny Sanders and rookie Henry Ruggs. That's and, more for Hardman. and more importantly, ahead of Sammy Watkins, right? Yeah, Sammy Watkins is going much later. Um, why? Thirteen oh four is why. That's the question. That's the question I ask is why. I think it's because we don't have the we don't see the warts on Hardman like we do with Watkins. In other words, we haven't seen the disappointing years from Hardman. We haven't seen the injuries from Hardman. He has the mystery box quality, whereas Watkins does not. We know what we have in Watkins. We don't necessarily know what we have in Hardman. And I think that's why football guys drafters, by the way, wrongfully drafting McCall Hardman ahead of Sammy Watkins. Yeah, I think that is wrongfully. I mean, when you look at the depth charts, Watkins is the number two wide receiver. You look at what happened in the freaking Super Bowl playoffs and everything, Watkins yeah. crushed it. Yeah. You know, it's funny, actually, I somehow was, it was, I was just watching ESPN Classic or ESPN University or whatever. I, was, I don't know what year, 2004 National Championship game or whatever. Clemson? Clemson against... Uh, I don't know who who would well, have Watkins had 16 catches for 230 yards. Yeah, I mean, it's just unbelievable. They yeah, could that, not... that might is that Ohio State. It might have been Ohio. Yeah, Ohio State. Yeah, okay, yeah. Braxton Miller was the quarterback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so it was like they could not even touch this guy. I mean, he just looked like such a stud. I know he's had the foot issues over the years, but good and gracious, I mean, the talent. Kenny Watkins is a super talented player, and uh, he's been showing it lately. I mean, really, he's a, he's a good player. I mean, I, I get it. I mean, he's had some problems, but. But Cole Hartman's got nothing on Sammy Watt at this point. All right, so there is an article uh, that you need to read, and I'm trying to find out where it is. It was all about Sammy Watkins. Um, it might have been Bleacher Report that had it, about his mental health issues. And, he, you know, he, he, I thought he was an alcoholic. Yeah, he was an alcoholic. He had depression, uh, all these things. And, and I was reading, and I can't remember if it was that story, but I was reading an article, not that this, this has anything to do with fantasy football, but quotes from fellow receivers and his Chiefs teammates. He is a very, he has a very Arian Foster-like outlook on life. He's a very, um, uh, I don't know how to phrase this. He, um, 
he's constantly thinking outside the box. He's always looking at the bigger picture. He's a big thinker. You know, I think that's fine. You know, I think it's funny because people think negatively about someone who actually is, is, is <laughs> independently. Yeah, exactly. oh, oh, good God. You know, if you're not Stick trying, to football, for yeah, God's sake. Yeah. Please don't give us your opinion, Kanye West, Arian Foster, Ricky Boyd. <laughs> for God's sake, man. <laughs> Um, you know, good for him. Good yeah. for Terry Walker. They like that. Actually. And and to get him in the 13th round. And you know, I think a lot of the reasons that people are taking McCole Hardman, Dave, are the same reasons they should be taking Watkins. And when you consider that Watkins is ahead of him on the depth chart, what are you doing? You know, it's I get the mystery box and the unknown, but Watkins in the 13th to me is so much more attractive you have, I mean, than Hardman in the 10th. Yeah, think about defenses. You have to deal with Tyree Kill. You have to deal with Kelsey. I mean, two all pros. You have yeah. Holmes, who's just a like, superstar. And then a running back. I mean, the running backs are good. The insane. tandem is awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, Offensive line is really good. The problem is that Watkins will have the injury it's forgotten because Kelsey's always open. And Tyree Kill just, you know, caught an 80-yard touchdown and so forth. But, but p- part that. of the reason he's going in the 13th, yeah, right, you know. Exactly. All right, so let's move. Just getting, getting, getting a piece of that offense in the 13th is, is great. It's dynamite. Absolutely dynamite. Alex in Fort Myers. Hey, Balky and Dave, I know you guys have brought this up before when you talk about quote-unquote super offenses that have every skill guy going high, and I thought you could apply for the Bucks this season. Which of the quote-unquote big four is going to be the bust in FFPC leagues? So we talked about this actually with Tom Brady a few years ago with New England with Brandon Lloyd, Edelman, Gronk, and Aaron Hernandez, and now we have a couple of those guys involved again with Gronk. Um, uh, in Tom Brady, obviously. But then you also have Evans Godwin and O.J. Howard down there, too, as well. Is, is it, is uh, Hernandez is, is the boss of the lifetime. The lifetime boss of that, of that group. Anyway, okay. okay. So is, is, is it just obvious to say O.J. Howard or could Chris Godwin or Mike Evans actually hurt you more? I think uh, let's just throw Ho- Howard out. Howard's too easy. Okay. So I think, I think the boss is Mike Evans out of the group of Evans, really? Godwin, okay. and Gronk. Uh, I mean, you're like talking about on an ADP basis. It really could be Gronk. I can tell you one thing. I don't think it's Godwin because Godwin's just commanding all those targets. He's the over the middle guy. And you think that's going to happen again this year, even with I the do, addition? Yeah, I okay. feel like Godwin has some Edelman type traits in him a little bit, where he, he goes over the middle and he, he just commands the ball. He's going to command targets. I think that that's where you're at with him. Evans and Gronk will be competing for touchdowns, you know, in the red zone. So I think you know, touchdown targets. I think that's an issue. You know, that's a good point because Godwin is is at the 209 and Evans is right now at the 305. You know, so even though Godwin is going a half round higher, to me, I think you're right. I think you, not necessarily that it, you've sold me on it, but I think he is the, you know, ostensibly the safer pick, essentially, there at the end of the second round rather than waiting to the mid. Uh, you are paying a little bit of a premium, mini, a mini premium. And I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. You know who's going after Mike Evans? Alan Robinson. I think I'd rather have Robinson than Evans. You know who else is going after Evans? DJ Moore. I think I'd rather have DJ Moore. And then another guy in there, and I, don't, I haven't made up my mind, and we, we have a moratorium on talking about the outspoken wide receiver from Cleveland who yeah. shall not be named. But he's Old an interesting guy there, too. Yes, exactly. What do you mean? Um, you know what's funny? I mean, like, you look at Allen Robinson and DJ Moore. I mean, I feel like those guys are, like, open every play. Like, yeah. Allen Robinson last year, Allen Robinson was open every play. Yeah. But Trubisky hit him what he could. Yeah, so, I mean, hopefully Nick Foles can hit more. Appreciate. Foles and Robinson are both ex Jaguars, but they were never on the team together, right? Because Foles was just you. there last year. Yeah, they're not. They weren't ex teammates. Okay. Talk crap about the owner, Jahan Khan, or whatever his name. You don't like him? I have no. I don't. Know, he's fine. I'm sure he's a lovely fellow. I know his. Uh, I would his, love to know more billionaires. Yeah. I know exactly zero right now. It's a three comic book. Really? Yeah. Do you know any billionaires? Yeah. Um, um, Farrell? No. Uh, no, not Farrell. Um, <laughs> um, Ross Hanneman. I mean, I'm yeah. a real <laughs> No, I don't. Um, I know them. They don't know me. All right, final email tonight. I want to sneak one more in before we uh, go. Uh, Jeff in New York, I can't believe I'm asking this, but do I need to seriously start looking at Antonio Brown in main event drafts this season? TIA, that is Jeff in New York. Jeff, thank you for the email. Dave, uh, you know, I don't want to totally poo-poo this, but Antonio Brown is going at the 908 in football guys' drafts right now with wide really, receiver 40. He's blown up lately. Yeah. He's, he's blown the coop. Now, I have a strong opinion on this, but I'll let you talk about Antonio Brown first here at the 908. Guys, he's at the 908. Let's say he's doing a main event draft, one of these early slows. I think I actually don't – I'm going to go against my own real opinion. This is weird. I'm going to say something and say something against it. I think he's not worth it, but I think you take a shot. If you're doing an early slow main, right, yep. or whatever. Yep. 
you meet a thionoate, or you know, a thionoate bronze. You take Antonio Brown, and you know, assuming you're going to do like four or five teams, not just one team, because if you okay. does one team in a soulmate event, is your only team, you're an idiot. <laughs> I mean, you're you're not, not an idiot for that. You're not an idiot, but, I mean, you're taking your one shot early, and that's actually that's you know what that's maybe that's smart. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm you. Um, someone's an idiot. So you take your shot, but then take Antonio Brown. Why not? Who gives a crap? Right. And uh, if he if he ends up signing with Seattle and he's like a superstar or whatever they were talking about. He's, he's worth the third or fourth round pick. He doesn't freak out. Maybe the odds, are, than that. the odds are against it, but whatever. Right. Um, I think you take your shot, and uh, and then and then you have you have your um, you have your lottery ticket, so to speak, right? And that's my take on early drafts. I think in general you kind of you know that's pretty early. Value wise, there's got to be somebody better at that spot. All right, so let's talk about that. Right. Five wide receivers are currently going in the ninth round. One of them is Antonio Brown. The two guys going above him are Christian Kirk and Marvin Jones. The two guys after him are CeeDee Lamb and Darius Slade. So knowing that, if you're looking at a wide receiver in the ninth round, do any of those guys really strike you as, oh, I really should have those guys over Antonio Brown? Well, I mean, can you tell me what's going to happen? Okay, I can tell you what I think is going to happen. All right, well, tell me what you think is going to happen. And then I'll Here's what I think is going to happen. Now, there's plenty of quarterbacks around the NFL. Well, say, how long do you think his suspension is going to be? That's what I wanted to get eight to. Eight games? Uh, games? I think it's more than eight. For, what, what did he do exactly? Tell what me. didn't he do, Dave? He's, he's got all these legal issues against him. What? And remember, stuff that he's been, already been cleared on, that doesn't stop Roger Goodell from suspending him either. We've seen that in the past, too, where people are cleared of criminal charges, but Goodell still suspends them. All right, so here's what I want to get into. Um, Antonio Brown is Lamar Jackson, Russell – he was catching passes from Russell Wilson recently. Deshaun Watson, these, these guys all want him on their team, right? Um, if one of those teams decides to sign Antonio Brown. Um, they're not – by the way, if they're picking – they're saying they want him on the team, they're not expecting an eight-plus game suspension. Players don't think like that. They just want the talent there. Oh. And, and what I, I mean, in my opinion, I don't think they think of stuff like that. GMs think of stuff like that. Oh. Coaches think of stuff like that. Say what you will about Bill O'Brien, but he would be considering something like that with the Antonio Brown. Um, let's say one of these guys sign him. Okay, fine, he's on the team. Then all of a sudden the NFL has to fast track this investigation, which apparently has been going on for years, uh, into what, what Antonio Brown's been get, getting into with – the assault and battery, with the sexual assaults, everything like that. Uh, then they fast track it, and then they suspend him. So now you're talking about already where you want to get off to a fast start in the main event or in the Football Guys Players Championship. Now this guy that you're soaking a ninth-round pick into could be suspended for six games, eight games, and miss most of the regular se- fantasy regular season eight for to, you? Eight to ten games is what's being banned. Okay, eight to ten games. So there's a chance, let's say it's ten. He's not back until your final regular season FFPC game. And are you really going to start him then unless you have massive body issues? Yeah, and point. you have to carry him on your roster this whole time. I feel like in the ninth round, I'm not, and I'm not seriously making a case for any of these other receivers. But I will say this. Um, Tony Pollard, Austin Hooper, um, uh, Marlon Mack, Tariq Cohen, all well, these guys are going in the ninth round. To me, let's just talk receiver. That, let's talk receiver. Okay, then I'm taking – I'm taking – If you think – I mean, if he's suspended 10 games, then they all are better picks. They really are. All right. Well, I'm just trying to think on the short end of the spectrum here. I mean, I'm not a Marvin Jones guy. Okay, maybe I could see, see him there. And, I, you know, Chris, Christian Kirk, let's talk about him for a second. You think he's going too high? I mean, he is the second banana in, in Arizona, if you're not a Fitzgerald believer, um, with behind Hopkins. And Murray's already been working on with those guys. I, I would rather have Kirk than Antonio Brown, actually. Now that I think about it. Yeah, I guess for sure. Um, I'd rather. Yeah, if he's playing ten games, yeah. Well, I mean, even if it's eight or whatever, I don't know. I here's the thing. I get it if you want to take a chance on him at this point in the season. That makes perfect sense. I will not be one of those people taking a chance on Antonio Brown. If you do, Godspeed, because you're going to need it. That's my pick. Fair enough. All right, sounds good. All right, and that's the note we're going to leave it off with uh, on the show tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I want to uh, thank, of course, Mark Davidson for hopping aboard, Dave Gerzak, the FFPC, Rob Rice, and, of course, each and every one of you. We are live next Friday, 15-time FFPC Best Ball and Football Guys League champ Frank Nunez is going to be joining the program really? next week. Oh, yeah. And Nunez, that'll be interesting. Interesting story of how he got the invite to the show, too, by the way. 
Um, I'm not not going to say what happened. You will have to listen next week to find out how he got the invite. I'm looking forward to the interview. All right, so book those flights and rooms for Las Vegas uh, to be out there in a couple of months for the FFPC live events. Remember to get in on that main event early bird, only three days left at midnight Pacific time. The early bird, as they say, flies away. Check out the uh, Football Guys Players Championship. we got a midnight draft going off in about 45 minutes. Ten teams left, Dave. In that yep, one? Very good. So, yeah, get in now. Uh, check out the best ball slims and the VP cash leagues. We shouldn't forget about the VP cash leagues that are going on. MyFFPC.com. Those start at $35, go up to 1000 Plenty of action there. And, of course, Terminator Sats, uh, the Dynasty Startups, uh, everything. I mean, whatever you're looking for, Superflex, it's there at MyFFPC.com. I want to wish everybody a very safe and happy 4th of July. Don't, 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 don't pull your friggin' hand up. Don't like pull a JPP. Yes, exactly. He's with the Bucks now. Uh, and of course, ladies and gentlemen, your holiday weekend starts now. This has been another episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com that was broadcast live and heard around the world. Eric and Dave will be back next week with more analysis, interviews, and advice from a guest much smarter than they are. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk with you again next week. Dave, I, uh, I forgot to mention this to you. I was on Roto Baller Radio this morning on Sirius XM, and I was talking to Real Talk Raf about uh, 4th of July, and he said, well, I know that, uh, uh, Eric Balkman, you are planning on having some adult beverages, shooting off fireworks, and hanging out with your kids. And I said, yeah, not all at the same time. I, <laughs> I feel like that would probably not be very responsible to do. And he said, ah, you know, the kids grew – or no, I said, I'm like, you know, maybe I do all three and the kids grow up a little bit this weekend. You actually have fireworks? I, I was saying tonight before I, I came over to the studio, we were uh, shooting them off in my backyard. You have, you have the good ones or do you Nah, it's just, you know, what run of the mill, whatever. Um, but um, I posted a, a video of my buddy uh, who was over, uh, El Grande, you know him. What? Um, yeah, he, he was shooting them off. I posted a video to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram about it. And my mother – it has been blowing up my messenger. You know, those are illegal. You can't do they're, they're shooting too high up. Like it's it's some, it has something to do with, with the ones Mr. that... Bush isn't getting the crappy one. Uh, we did get... We just wanted something for the kids. I mean, he's probably getting you know, something that's solid. I mean, hey, it was, I mean, it was better than I ever had right. when I was a kid. Yeah. They, they started... He's not getting the snakes. We did those tonight, too. <laughs> and you know what? Here's, here's the funny thing about the snakes. He, he had no problem lighting off the big ones, the big sparkly ones that shoot up. Yeah. The snakes, he couldn't do. He had to ask my wife how to do it. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, just... Hey, guys, kids, watch it. Yeah. And just, <laughs> yeah, he, had, he struggled with those, but the, the, the real, um, you know, ones that can wreck houses. The no Yes. On that note, be safe, everybody. <laughs> don't, don't set any fires don't this do weekend. Any, don't do any of that. Join some drafts instead. Thank you, everybody. Talk to you next week.